In today's lecture, I would like to focus on Japan's distinctive history. Uh, this is the second in the six lecture series, and I want to go over some of the unique and important uh, aspects of Japan's modern history. Let me start by saying that, uh, as I pointed out in the first lecture, geography, Japan has had centuries of isolation. That is, in some senses, more than a thousand years of bucolic uh, isolation from uh, foreign invasion, from foreign conquest, uh, wars that are caused by uh, foreign countries. And this self-imposed isolation, um, this ge geological isolation, became a state policy in 1603, the 17th 18th and into the middle of the 19th century when the Tokugawa shogunate took power in Japan and systematically cut off contact with the rest of the world. So this period of two and a half centuries, 1603 to 1868, came at a time of dynamism and ferment in the West, in particularly Western Europe, and this had significant ripple effect consequences uh, for Japan. During the period of Tokugawa rule, Japan also experienced uh, a century of zero population growth from 1721 to 1848. And Japan, after it was opened up to the West in the mid-19th century, um, went from a frenzied attempt to stave off Western colonization to becoming an Asian colonizer of East Asia and Southeast Asia. So Japan went from a potential colony to becoming a military colonizer. And this is another distinctive aspect of modern Japanese history. And in the process of Japan's industrialization, and as I pointed out in the first lecture, the first uh, non-Western nation to be able to industrialize, Japan adopted and fused Western institutions, Western ideas, uh, Western technology with Japanese tradition, Japanese society, Japanese culture, and Japanese institutions. So let me start with isolation, a millennium of isolation. Because of its uh, position as an island archipelago removed from the Asian continent, Japan has been free of foreign uh, conquest, foreign invasion and conquest. The last Japanese expeditionary force that was sent from Japan to the continent uh, in the early part of his history was the year 663, that is the mid 7th century. And it was not until the late 16th century that Japan attempted to invade Korea. So it was not foreign countries seeking to invade Japan that succeeded. It was Japan uh, outward uh, attempts in the mid 7th century and in the late 16th century to invade overseas. In both cases, both ways, coming and going, the uh, expeditions were unsuccessful. And so until the mid 19th century, when uh, Japan was occupied by Allied forces, in the aftermath of the Pacific War, Japan was basically isolated from the rest of the world. The geostrategic context of Japan's isolation, its island arch archipelago security bubble, is seen in contrast to the Eurasian continent, 
If you look at any of the Western states or the, the states in the Middle East, um, you see, the, or uh, uh, Russia, uh, the Russian uh, landmass, you see that there have been one after another empires that have taken shape through military expansion and conquest. So the countries of Western Europe, for example, have experienced the Roman Empire. Uh, and we see a map of how extensive the Roman Empire was, extending through the Middle East and Western and Eastern Europe into even including uh, England. You see constant warfare, foreign invasions, military expeditions uh, throughout the history of the West. By contrast, Japan as an island archipelago was spared this type of constant foreign invasion and warfare. And if you look at Japan and compare it to England, which is another island uh, nation, you see that England and Scandinavia, uh, a peninsular area, lay in the uh, arc of co contestation, that is military con contests, wars that were taking place. And these two areas, England and Scandinavia, in the uh, vortex of these wars, became military powers themselves, seafaring powers, and developed their own military empires, something which Japan, until the early 20th century, never did, never became a military conquering power like England or Scandinavia. In 1603, the Tokugawa uh, shogunate came to power in Japan, ending a century of domestic warfare between rival families, rival clans in various parts of Japan. And so for the next two and a half centuries, the Tokugawa shogunate presided over a united Japan, loosely united Japan, a peaceful Japan. Edo became the um, capital of Japan and the Tokugawa government uh, presided over what became a balance of power in Japan. The rival clans or families that the Tokugawa defeated were allowed to exist, but they were relegated to the outskirts, the periphery of Japan. And they were surrounded by uh, clans that were loyal to the Tokugawa, the Tozama uh, daimyo, that is the rival daimyo, who fought against the Tokugawa, were surrounded by Shimpan and Fudai daimyo. The Shimpan relating, uh, meaning clans that were loyal to the Tokugawa and fought alongside the Tokugawa, 23 of them. And they were adjacent to the Tokugawa, which arrogated to itself the choicest land, uh, particularly in and around the Kanto area. And next to the Shimpan, or the uh, uh, Tokugawa-related clans, were the Fudai clans, 145 of them, uh, small uh, land holdings that were close to the Shimpan and the Tokugawa. The Tokugawa, therefore, presided over a balance of power with 100 uh, or so Tozama rival clans uh, uh, relegated to the peripheral regions of Japan. And these rival clans were expected to send every other year their daimyo and families to Edo to reside for long periods of time in Edo. This was called the Sanking Kotai system, a system of ritual uh, loyalty uh, symbolized in their going physically to reside in the city of Edo. 
It was a symbol of Tokugawa's supremacy and it was de facto a kind of hostage system where the daimyo are there physically uh, next to the uh, shogunate and his military forces. This system was similar in many respects to that of uh, France under its absolute monarchy, uh, Louis XIV. Nobles, particularly the powerful nobles, were expected to spend six months a year at the Palace of Versailles um, with uh, uh, King Louis XIV. So this Tokugawa system, a loosely unified, peaceful state for two and a half centuries, uh, led to a very stable political system in which the goal of the Tokugawa shogunate was to stabilize, indeed to freeze, the status quo. And what they wanted to do was to contain and curtail threats of subversive change to the Tokugawa government. So they took steps, uh, for example, cutting off Japan from contact with the rest of the world, squelching the spread of Christianity, which is taking hold in the island of Kyushu, and um, forbidding travel to or travel from the outside world. There was a small port in Nagasaki where the Dutch were allowed to uh, uh, operate, but outside of that, uh, contact with the West was shut down. It brought diplomacy and trade and travel to a halt. And this, in the 17th, 18th, and mid 19th century, came at a crucial time. It was crucial because it first stopped Japan's naval exploration of the North American and South American continent. By the 15th century and into the 16th century, Japan was showing signs of becoming a naval power in Asia. Ships were landing on the west coast of the United States and in Central and Latin America. It's possible that if the Tokugawa shogunate had not cut off contact and forbid the travel outside of Japan, that the west coast of the United States and Latin America would have been settled by the Japanese, um, not the Mexicans uh, or uh, not the uh, white Americans uh, later on. Japan might have, become, might have become a major seafaring power like England and Scandinavia, or Spain and Portugal. It might indeed have entered into the building of colonial empires, just as the Western powers did for four or more centuries. Isolation in the 17th and 18th century, uh, going into the mid 19th century, also cut off Japan from the dynamism of social, cultural, technological, economic, and political change in Europe. This was the period of dynamic change of, Japan, of Europe's transformation from an agrarian to an industrial uh, continent. It was the age of enlightenment. Philosophy flourished, and with these uh, developments in philosophy came mathematics and science, chemistry, biology, physics. There was a religious and cultural transformation in the West. Um, there was a political uh, transformation of the greatest importance. The landed aristocracy revolted against the absolute power of the monarchy in England and in France, and they forced the kings to submit to constitutional role, constitutional legal-based uh, governance. 
where representative institutions like the parliament were formed, constitutions were formulated and abided by, and limits placed on the power of the state. Modern nation states took shape during this period of time, and the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 established a new international system based on the units of nation states. There were major technological breakthroughs, especially the utilization of steam, uh, steam energy as a driver of factories and ships and transportation. Corporations were formed, markets were developed and spread, and the infrastructure of capitalism thus took shape. So at this critical period of dynamism, ferment, and growth, where Europe makes the transition to industrialization and to democracy, Japan was cut off from all contact with Europe and fell behind uh, the West in all of these domains. The consequences and implications of this isolation were therefore substantial. On the positive side, it meant that Japan had this bubble of national security from foreign contact and invasion. Uh, also, it provided Japan the opportunity, and especially the peace, to um, develop its own internal infrastructure, uh, agriculture, markets, and so forth, uh, that made it possible for Japan to industrialize once it was opened up to the West in the mid-19th century. So one of the fascinating developments during the Tokugawa period from 1603 to 1868 uh, was that there was zero population growth from the early 18th century to the mid-19th century. In 1721, the population of Japan was 26 million. It was roughly the same size as Russia. It was larger than France and other countries, of course, much smaller than China. But more than a century later, by 1848, Japan's population was still 26 million, smaller than Russia, much smaller, smaller than France. And economic historians of Europe have pointed out that industrial development in European states was made possible by low population and in some cases zero population growth. Low population growth, zero population growth, was the uh, essential foundation for the rise of industrial capitalism. Why? Because zero population growth meant that the number of people consuming goods in society um, and society assuming that agriculture uh, became more and more productive would have more resources available with the same number of population. This would lead to a rise in per capita income and with uh, greater per capita income for households, capital could be allocated, invested in textiles, in small machinery, and other areas outside of agriculture, and you could have industrial development take place. So the zero population growth period in uh, Tokugawa, Japan, in very important respects, laid the foundations for Japan's industrial development uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. So how did Japan achieve zero population growth? The traditional interpretation, uh, the, the reason that people used to point to was Malthusian, that is the theory of Robert Malthus, in which he argued that population tended to stabilize, that is not grow, when it bumped up against 
the limits of natural resources and disasters so that when mankind grew to a certain size, the land could no longer continue to produce food and goods to sustain a larger population. And when you combine that with sickness, uh, pandemics, epidemics, uh, which wiped out large portions of the population, and with natural disasters, uh, you had a stabilization of population growth and uh, therefore uh, periods of time in which uh, zero population growth took place. That was a theory that was applied to uh, Tokugawa Japan. There is another theory, however, which uh, states that poor nutrition, that rice as a main staple of nutrition lacked the proteins, lacked the nutritional elements needed for high fertility rates, and that therefore Japanese households had low fertility rates, and this was seen also in Korea. But more recent historical research suggests that village birth and death records um, demonstrate that there was a uh, deliberate sex selective infanticide policy that was in effect during this period. That is to say, baby girls were allowed to die after birth. Males were kept because males were prized in agricultural households for their labor capabilities more than women. So when farming families had small plots of land, there were limits, according to this theory, of how large of a family they could su sustain and how large of a workforce they needed within the family. And because of the preference for males, baby girls were allowed to die and there was zero population growth from 1721 to 1848. At this time, uh, during this period, there was technological improvement, improvements in irrigation, in fertilizers, in agricultural uh, tools, the emergence of commercial markets to sell excess supply of farm goods, the development and spread of currency, uh, and therefore the rise in per capita income and the development of a economic basis for industrialization later on with this zero population growth. GDP growth during the Tokugawa period was fairly substantial as you see in this PowerPoint. Uh, it was a period uh, because of the peace and isolation and the growth of agriculture a uh, period of uh, development for the Japanese economy. Japanese historians uh, writing textbooks tend to characterize this period, the Tokugawa period, as a period of backwardness, of feudalism, darkness, uh, opportunity cost. Japan falls far behind the West during this period and the Japanese household, the farmers, tend to suffer uh, from bare subsistence uh, livelihood. Western historians of Japan, by contrast, often see the Tokugawa period, the Edo period as it's called, as positive, as laying the essential foundations for Japan's modernization. Tokugawa period saw uh, an expansion of literacy among males, so that by the mid-19th century, when the Tokugawa regime collapsed, uh, nearly 50% of the male population was literate. Furthermore, the value system that took root during Tokugawa, uh, combining elements of Confucianism, Buddhism, and Shintoism, that the value system uh, produced uh, the equivalent of the Protestant ethic in the West. 
the famous Protestant ethic uh, coined by the social scientist Max Weber, who argued that countries like England successfully industrialized because they were a Protestant country and Protestantism made it mandatory for people to show that they were among the chosen by working hard, deferring gratification, accumulating savings, and being frugal uh, in, their, uh, in, in, in their livelihood. This same equivalent of the Protestant ethic in the case of Japan was seen as industriousness, that is working hard, frugality, that is not consuming everything you produce immediately, uh, savings, uh, and looking to the future for a better livelihood. The culture of this Protestant ethic equivalent, therefore, some sociologists and economists believe made Japan compatible with the requirements of capitalism. During this time also, uh, Tokugawa period, Japan developed urban centers, uh, Osaka, Tokyo, uh, places where castle towns became the hub of uh, markets uh, and accumulation of people. So you see that in this period, there was a development of urban clusters that were connected to one another and eventually became the infrastructure for modern Japan. During the Tokugawa uh, two and a half centuries also, you had a loose unification of the country the removal of the samurai warriors from the land who were then placed into castle towns on stipends. You therefore removed one of the key uh, sectors of society from the possession of land and uh, the defense of the possession of land. You had the development of bureaucratic institutions in the various fiefdoms uh, scattered throughout Japan, the uh, Tokugawa clan, the Fudai clan, the Shimpan, and the Tozama. And you had, over time, the emergence of a national identity that is not an identity with your clan as such, but an identity as Japan. And with the opening of the, uh, by the West of Japan, you had triggered a revolt against the Tokugawa government, the overthrow of that Tokugawa government by um, uh, protesters, resistors from the Tozama uh, clans in Kyushu and Shikoku in particular. Sakamoto Ryoma symbolizes the kind of rebellious samurai that overthrew the Tokugawa regime, a semi-feudalistic regime, and established the Meiji regime, which was committed to industrialization and modernization. Fukoku Kyohei became the slogan for this new Meiji government, that is, rich nation, industrialization, powerful military, preventing colonization. And Japan, um, in the Meiji period and in uh, periods thereafter, showed a remarkable capacity to fuse Western and Japanese features of culture and economy and governance. This fusion, this capacity to adapt and adopt, goes back to Shotoku Taishi in the late 6th century, early 7th century, the regent of Japan who centralized the country way back then, harmonizing the warring factions, and promulgated a seven-article constitution borrowed from China. It was the first written legal code in Japan and consolidated the foundations of the imperial cult, uh, court in Japan. Shotoku Taishi also dispatched imperial missions to the imperial court in China and consolidated the acceptance of Buddhism 
as one of the key religions uh, in Japan. And in his life and in his writings, the word Nihon, Japan, land of the rising sun, appears for the first time. The Meiji period borrowed from Europe, particularly Prussia and England. And in the post-war period, after the Pacific War, Japan borrowed heavily from the United States. So Japan has been, of all of the Asian countries, perhaps the most open, in spite of its many centuries of isolation, to adoption of the best features uh, from the West and the outside world. One of the paradoxes that I pointed out in the uh, first lecture was that after a millennium of isolation, Japan transforms itself to becoming a military expansionist state. How did that happen? Well, when Japan was opened up in 1853 by Commodore Perry, the US uh, representative, this came at the height of Western imperialism, Western colonialism. And for several hundred years, the Western states, because of developments of their technology and industrial uh, uh, infrastructure, because of their seafaring capability, dominated uh, the rest of the world. The threat to the Meiji government in the mid-19th century was that there would be a colonization of Japan by the superior force of the West. So in order to prevent that from happening, the Meiji government restored imperial rule as the, imperial, uh, the emperor and removed the shogunate and adopted the modern institutions of governance a constitution, an elected parliament with upper and lower houses, a modern centralized meritocratic bureaucracy, particularly finance and commerce uh, ministries, centralized education, early education for the whole, all the people, Elimination of feudal classes, the samurai, the artisan, the farmers, and the merchants, and the adoption of modern corporation, banks, capital markets, the construction of infrastructure, energy, transportation, communications, and food. And through this process of adoption and uh, modernization, Japan hoped to avoid colonization and indeed became a colonizer in its own right. It developed a powerful army, navy, and air force. So in the uh, opening of Japan, Japan was fortunate to have avoided uh, being occupied by the Western colonial powers. One reason was because Japan was an island archipelago, small and dispersed, seemingly not a big prize in the eyes of the Western colonizers, compared to China, compared to Indonesia, compared to other countries on the Asian continent, such as uh, Malaysia and um, uh, Myanmar. So this uh, period, of uh, Japan's formative development took place as an independent and autonomous power. And Japan avoided, like Thailand, was spared Western colonization. Now how is it that Japan then became a colonizer, a military expansionist power? Well, the main fear in the minds of the Japanese leaders during the Meiji uh, period and afterwards was the fear of Russia. There was a fear that Russia would have designs on controlling Korea and Manchuria 
and by the control of Korea and Manchuria would threaten Japan's national security. So Japan got entangled in a series of wars that brought it into military involvement in Korea, Manchuria, China, and after China throughout Southeast Asia. This was the first major and sustained military push that Japan made in its 2000 year history. The first war was in the late 19th century, the Sino-Japanese War, uh, in which Japan was able to annex Taiwan as a prize of winning that war. The next war in the early 20th century was the Russell-Japanese War. Japan took on a powerful Western state, defeated Russia, or at least uh, held its own against Russia, and was allowed to uh, annex Korea as a prize of that conflict. Once it had achieved um, possession of Korea, Japan started worrying about Manchuria. If the Russians came in and controlled Manchuria, it would threaten their possession of Korea. Therefore, Japanese military officers decided to invade Manchuria, take control of that region as a buffer against Korea, and because Manchuria possessed uh, major natural resources, that uh, the Japanese military wanted. But in order to control Manchuria, Japan worried about China and therefore invaded China to secure Manchuria. And the expansion into China, actually the expansion into Manchuria and then followed by expansion into China, locked Japan into the Asian continent in a way that made clash with the other Asian countries and with the United States almost inevitable. The United States and Western powers refused to recognize Japan's conquests and insisted that Japan pull back uh, all the way back to Korea, giving up Manchuria and holdings in the mainland of China. During this period, the Japanese um, society uh, was transformed into uh, a society that strongly supported the military uh, expansion. There was runaway nationalism, or what Maruyama Masao, the famous uh, political scientist at the University of Tokyo, called ultranationalism. And it was based on a particularistic value system, a value system based on the emperor. Because the emperor in uh, pre-war Japan, early Japan, was regarded as a direct divine descendant of the sun goddess, the loyalty to the emperor by the people was seen as ultimate value, a religious value, not just a political one and sacrificing one's life to the emperor and to the imperial nation um, was an ultimate uh, act of uh, good. Kamikaze pilots therefore were prepared to uh, plunge their airplanes into aircraft carriers as a uh, sign of their commitment and loyalty to the emperor and the imperial nation. In this particularistic value system, Maruyama argues, almost any act of aggression, any act of expansion could be justified as serving the interests of the emperor and the imperial nation. And almost any act domestically of violence could also be justified uh, as long as the name of the emperor was intoned. So that from 19 the late 1920s through the 1930s, there was a period of uh, assassinations where rambunctious military officers would assassinate civilian leaders 
that were critical or not enthusiastic about military expansion. And opposition to military expansion abroad was crushed um, by the state. And the military leaders took control over the uh, institutions of governance. During the 1900s, 19, uh, into the 1920s, Japan showed signs of turning into a parliamentary democracy, but the rise of the militarists and the crushing of opposition as Japan expanded overseas meant that the Japanese nation was converted into what Maruyama Masao calls a nationalistic uh, state. There were clashing perceptions of the West in Japan about the outward expansion. The, the West saw Japan's expansion as renegade, unlawful, cruel, uh, as uh, really not something that could be tolerated. The Japanese, by contrast, saw expansion into Asia as a means of liberating Asia from Western colonization. They furthermore saw their deeds as doing what Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union were also doing, that is expanding, and Germany were doing, expanding their force overseas. In the United States, the government had proclaimed the Monroe Doctrine in the early 19th century in which it had said that foreign powers should keep their hands off of North and South America because that was a special zone of interest to the United States. Japanese leaders felt that Asia, East Asia, was also a zone of special interest to Japan and, and basically felt that Japan should have a same right to uh, the U.S. Monroe Doctrine in Asia. And America's posture on the Monroe Doctrine and its intolerance of Japan's conquest was therefore seen as hypocrisy, allowing the U.S. to do what it wanted, preventing Japan to do what they wanted. So there was this basic clash in the perceptions of uh, Japan and the Western powers. And theorists of international relations believe that this period in the mid 19th century, uh, 20th century was a period of declining hegemonic power by Great Britain, the rise of new powers, Japan, Italy, Germany, and the international system tends to become destabilized during these periods of transition, power transition from hegemon to a rising uh, military power. And in this case, um, they argue that the Pacific War, the Second World War, was in many senses a playing out of this large structure of change, this uh, change in the balance of power between established powers and rising powers that never got reconciled. Other international specialists believe that the wars broke out because there was a clash of uh, nation states over finite natural resources, especially oil and energy. So that once the United States put an embargo on oil in retaliation for Japan's invasion of um, China and Southeast Asia that the Japanese leaders argued they could either accept so slow strangulation of its energy needs or they could strike back at the United States and seek to capture, uh, neutralize their naval cap capacities in Pearl Harbor and capture energy resources in Southeast Asia. And that led to the attack on Pearl Harbor. The Pacific War was by far the bloodiest in the 4,000 year history of Asia. The United States incurred uh, 92,000 deaths, 
56,000 wounded, but its own homeland was not invaded and therefore civilian casualties were uh, not part of the toll, as staggering as the toll was. Japan incurred a toll of 1.5 million deaths 250,000 civilian uh, casualties. 40% of Japan's physical infrastructure, its roads, its buildings, uh, its bridges, were destroyed by fire bombings and bombings, intensive bombing raids. And therefore, it incurred a huge uh, toll from its uh, quest to build a, an empire in East Asia. China suffered the biggest casualty toll of all, an estimated 10 to 20 million deaths, both soldiers and civilians. World War II, which includes the Pacific War and the war in the European theater, saw 50 to 7 million, 70 million deaths, 50 to 7, 70 million deaths, the biggest bloodbath in world history. And on August 14th, 1945, Japan accepted unconditionally surrender to the United States and the Western forces. The period of all-out frenzy to industrialize, to modernize, so that Japan could catch up with the West and fend off the West from colonizing the country came to naught in the ashes of the Pacific War. Japan's vision of empire, its ambition for dominance, uh, was destroyed. Its domestic infrastructure was leveled, exploded. And for the first time in its 2,000 year history, Japan came to be 